Hello and thank you for joining us for the Online Public Information Center for the Western Road and Sarnia Road Philippus' Environmental Assessment. My name is Megan Fontaine and I'm with the Communications Division at the City and I will be your host for today's meeting and the moderator of the Q&A session after the presentation. I would like to thank everyone who has taken the time to participate today. Um, before we begin, I would like to share the land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that the land on which we gather is the traditional territory of the Adewandaran, Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, and Lunapawak peoples who have long-standing relationships to the land, water, and the region of southwestern Ontario. The local First Nation communities of this area include the Chippewa of the Thames First Nation, Oneida Nation and of the Thames, and the Munsee Delaware Nation. Additionally, there is a growing urban Indigenous population who make the city of London home. We value the significant historical and contemporary contributions of the local and regional First Nations of Turtle Island. Now, since we are doing this virtually today, I'm going to get started with some engagement guidelines and some housekeeping so everyone knows how this is gonna run. Um, so to start, we have disabled the audio and the video um, for our guests. Um, you can see us, but we can't see you. Um, if you wanna send us a question or a comment at any point during the presentation, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, feel free to type in your question at any point, but we will be answering all questions at the end of the presentation. We've actually disabled the, the chat function. So again, just keep every uh, question or comment that you have in the Q&A box. That's where we'll be able to see it. If you're on the phone listening on the webinar and you have a question, um, we recommend emailing Carl, your project manager, or submitting it through the Get Involved website, um, and we can see your questions pop up that way. If you have a question but you're not comfortable asking it in this meeting, no worries. Um, you can, again, email your project manager um, at any time with questions related to this study. We have enabled closed captions for this meeting. They should be appearing right now on screen. Um, while it does a pretty good job at capturing what's being said, there are some errors. So if you need clarification on anything that's being presented, again, feel free to reach out or type it in the Q&A box as I will be monitoring um, for comments. If you happen to lose interconnect, internet connection or um, you know, it closes out by accident, no worries because you can rejoin the webinar at any time. It won't interrupt anything and, and you can hop back on at any time. All right, so with all of that said, I'm gonna hand it over to Carl to introduce the rest of the team. Hello, um, my name's Carl Grabowski. I'm the program manager from the city and I'd like to welcome you as well. This project started back, I'm gonna say six years ago and we got up to this point and passed this point of the first PIC with the, with the public. And, uh, and then the project was put on hold, unfortunately, because of a number of things happening in the city. And one of the things that was left some questions was the rapid transit uh, routes through this same area by the, the Western campus. So we put on hold and now we're restarting it. Um, at, we didn't come up to a point of recommendations back six years ago but uh, this intention of restarting the project is to lead to uh, a number of recommendations to improve Sarnia Road, Western Road, and uh, Philip Aziz. Uh, we still see a lot of pedestrians, cyclists, and uh, vehicles traveling through there, and some safety concerns and a lot of congestion. This study will kind of go over everything and come up with some recommendations. On this slide, you can see other members of the project team Unfortunately, Jane Fullick is not here to join us tonight. Uh, John Puccio is the project manager on the app, ACOM, our consultant, and he's here along with Carl and Paul. Uh, who, and I'm gonna hand it over to Paul at this point to start the next part of the presentation. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Uh, thanks for attending everybody. Uh, the quick agenda for this meeting is, We'll do the, we just did the introductions uh, and then we'll get into the purpose of the meeting. Uh, and then we will move into the presentation, which will be about 30 minutes. And then the uh, question and answer period that'll be facilitated by Megan will we'll, uh, be at the end. So to 
uh, the purpose of the project, and like of this uh, PIC, is to introduce the project. Uh, we want to provide an overview of what the municipal class environmental assessment is and how the process works. Uh, explain why the project was put on hold in 2016, which uh, Carl already touched on. Provide a summary of the previous work that was completed. Uh, describe the problem and opportunity statement that we've updated since the previous uh, project started. Uh, describe the existing conditions in the area, then that includes transportation, traffic, uh, natural heritage, uh, municipal servicing like water, wastewater, stormwater servicing, uh, in existing uh, archaeological and cultural heritage conditions. Uh, and then we'll move into presenting the alternative planning solutions uh, and how we evaluated them and what our, our preliminary recommendation is to move forward into phase three. And, uh, and you've already met the project team, but we'd like also to uh, receive your feedback on what we presented today. So first off, it's the, the process, the municipal class EA process. Uh, this process, it's, it's in accordance with the Ontario Environmental Assessment Act. And because this project has uh, potential for larger uh, environmental issues, uh, it's classed as a Schedule C project, which is required to follow all phases of the environmental assessment process. So the first phase is the problem and opportunity statement. Uh, this is where we review the background information, look at what the issues are, and come up with a statement that helps lead the project forward. Uh, we're now in phase two, which is the alternative planning solutions. So we, we review the, the existing conditions and we identify any feasible alternative solutions and then evaluate them against a set of criteria and come up with a recommended alternative solution to move forward into phase three. Uh, phase three would be the design concepts. So whatever uh, the recommendation from phase two is we use that recommendation to develop design concepts and then we evaluate those design concepts against the uh, the similar criteria that, that are used in phase two. Phase four is uh, the environmental study report. This basically is a report that will describe how we followed the process, any comments we've received. It will highlight all the background studies and our evaluation of the planning, as well as the design concept alternatives. Uh, we then put this report on out for review for a 30 day comment period after you get a notice of study completion. And that's when the public has a, a final opportunity to pro provide further comment based on what they read in the report. And after that is phase five, which is implementing the recommendations of the port report, going into detailed design and, and then eventually construction. Okay. And now John will take over here to discuss the, uh, the, the summary of the project in the study area and some of the existing conditions for the area. Thank you, Paul, and good evening. I am John Pukio, project manager for ACOM on this important assignment. As previously mentioned, uh, the City of London and ACOM initiated consultation work and conceptual design work as part of the original EA project between 2014 and 16. But during that time, alternatives for rapid transit routes were being considered through the University and Western Road itself. And given the potential uh, impact uh, of rapid transit on this EA process, the project was placed on hold in 2016. And as it relates to this project, uh, the northern routes of rapid transit were deferred to the future. And so the city has chosen to reactivate this project. So as we see in the map here, um, we have shown the study limits um, and they generally consist of the following. We have Western Road from the Huron University College entry at the north limits uh, down to Platts Lane at the south limits. We've got Sarnia Road and Philip Aziz Avenue corridor from, Kula, from Coombs Avenue at the west limit to the Thames River at the east limit. This is the same study area that was considered in the previous project, so nothing has changed in that respect. Uh, in terms of a brief overview of the roads, we have Western Road, which includes a double northbound and southbound lane with median turning lanes and multiple entrances uh, to the university and affiliated college, colleges commercial facilities and residences. Western Road for the most part has an urban cross section with curb and gutter. And with the exception of some sections between Lampton Drive and Sarnia Road, 
uh, where, where uh, asphalt extends directly to the sidewalk. Currently, there are no dedicated bike lanes except for a short stretch at the north end of the project limits. Uh, as well, there are no dedicated bus stops between Pat's Lane and, and Lambton Drive. There are some uh, dedicated bus stops, uh, pullovers essentially, uh, north of Lambton Drive. On Sarnia Road, we have currently a double eastbound and double westbound lanes with local median turn lanes approaching Western Road intersection. There are entrances to residences and institutions along this project length. This section of road is an urban cross section with curb and gutter throughout its length. And again, there are no dedicated bike lanes. On Philip Aziz, which is the section to the east part, uh, there's a single eastbound and a single westbound lane and a short southbound turn lane at the Western Node intersection. The road currently has no shoulders and no sidewalks. The roadway corridor widens further to the east with the addition of turn lanes leading up to the, state, the Western Stadium parking lot uh, and sidewalks there as well. And the north branch of the Thames River is located approximately 65 meters east of the bend in the road um, between Philip Aziz and Huron Drive. Sorry, Paul, I think we just go back to the previous slide there. Sorry about that. Uh, so essentially, uh, the current city master plan has identified the following improvements for this area. Uh, intersection improvements to accommodate forecast that increases to the traffic volumes, potential signal improvements to support transit as a priority, uh, general safety improvements at the intersection and along Western Road in general, and improvements to the road width along Philip Aziz Avenue. I should also mention um, some brief takeaways from the cycling master plan, and that includes buffered bike lanes on Sarnia Road, uh, shared bike route uh, with Cheryl's on Philip Aziz Avenue, and dedicated bike lanes on Western Road. So for the next couple of slides, we'll be reviewing existing conditions and background information. As Paul mentioned, we are in phase two of the EA study. In both phases one and two, we're primarily focused on the collection of information and conditions. And as you can appreciate, there is a large amount of information related to existing conditions. And these slides represent a brief summary of collected and analyzed information to date. This information does inform our thinking towards high level alternate solutions and uh, more detailed solutions moving forward into phases three and four. So with this first slides, this first slide uh, provides some challenges in data as we know. For example, we know that the two parking lots northwest of the Lambton Drive Sarnia Road intersection are the primary trip generating or destination areas within the study area. These are the Springette and University and Huron University College parking lots. We also know that there is a significant pedestrian volume in the study area and specifically um, on Western Road between Sarnia Road and Lambton Drive. The highest pedestrian volume generally occurs at the Western Road, Sarnia Road intersection. The lowest volume of people walking at this intersection is generally in the morning with much higher volumes during midday and afternoon peak hours. However, there is also a substantial amount of mid-block crossing uh, just north of the intersection. So between Sarnia Road and, and Lambton Drive the 400 meter separation between the main intersections may have something to do with that. We also know that there are some level of service issues at the Sarnia Road, Western Road intersections. Specifically, the intersection is operating at lower capacity levels, particularly in the morning and evening rush hours. We'll get into that a little bit on the next slide. And finally, we have some traffic data of, uh, of interest. And essentially we have a little over 28,000 vehicles per day on Western Road and about 24,000 vehicles per day on Sarnia Road. So it's not insignificant uh, volumes there. We have uh, intersection and mid-block collision data, which indicates over 200 collisions over a six year period under normal conditions and about 10 pedestrian car collisions. So the slide is, is perhaps uh, a little bit overwhelming. It's got uh, uh, quite a bit of a, an illustration here, but this is essentially the output, output of our traffic analysis for the area. There's a lot of information that is boiled down here into one slide. And while I don't wish to get into the weeds of the review, there are a number of issues evident at the key signalized intersection 
point of Western Road uh, and Sarnia Road to Lopez Aziz, uh, which should be highlighted. Uh, notably, there are several turn lanes operating at overcapacity, and these include the turn lane from Sarnia Road to northbound Western Road is over capacity in both the AM and peak uh, AM and PM peak hours. The turn lane from Philip Aziz, the turn lanes from Philip Aziz to Western Road is over capacity uh, in both directions in both the morning and afternoon rush hours. And the turn lane from Western Road to Westbound, Westbound Sarnia is over capacity in the afternoon rush hour only. Uh, there are also some through lane issues such as uh, southbound Western Road in the afternoon, but which may, may largely be due to the buses unloading uh, southwest of the intersection corner. So perhaps put another way, what we have here are, are basically all modes of transportation, be it pedestrians, bicyclists, buses, vehicles, they're all competing for green light time at particular times of the day and at particular locations. I guess conversely, it's all not, not all bad news. Capacity, uh, the capacity analysis do indicate that the majority of movements operate within a good level of service uh, or better, uh, I guess a level C or better operating in both the, uh, the morning and afternoon rush hours. So the next number of slides pertain to varied services within the study area. For potable, for potable water infrastructure, we have uh, an existing 400 uh, millimeter diameter water main along Western Road. The water main size decreases to 250 millimeters diameter just south of the Western Road, Sarnia Road intersection. And previous serving, uh, servicing studies identified the need to upsize the, the 250 millimeter diameter section of water main between Sarnia Road and Platts Lane to accommodate growth in the service area. The extent of that water main uh, upsizing is shown in yellow on that map. Uh, the existing, so we also have an existing 825 millimeter diameter sewer along Western Road that conveys uh, sanitary sewage uh, southward towards uh, and ultimately to the Greenway Pollution Control Plant. A previous study recommended upsizing, upsizing the sanitary trunk sewer between Sarnia Road and Platts Lane to a 975 millimeter diameter uh, pipe to accommodate growth expected within the Western University campus. The extent of this sewer upsizing is shown in yellow on the map. There, is other, there are other sanitary sewers uh, along Western Road to the north and Philip uh, Aziz Western Road. However, the upgrades for these piping uh, this piping was not identified at this time. I will note uh, one other item, the need for upsizing that southern leg shown on this, on this uh, map uh, may be eliminated uh, depending on the outcomes of future city work. Uh, if, for example, some flows to the north may be diverted to an alternate treatment plant, it may eliminate the, ups, uh, the upsizing of this uh, sanitary sewer. Uh, so that is currently being reviewed and that will be uh, implemented, uh, the impacts that will be implemented into this study as we move forward. Uh, there are a number of stormwater related issues identified uh, with the intersection of Philip Aziz Avenue and Sarnia Road, for example. Uh, there is significant ponding of storm runoff at the uh, intersection that has been observed. Uh, the storm sewers have decreasing sizes in the downstream direction uh, resulting in some capacity issues. And there are uh, ov uh, overflow uh, road drainage from Western Road uh, onto private lands between Brush Lane and Lambton Drive, onwards towards Sarnia Road, Sarnia Road and Philip Aziz Avenue. Um, we also have no formal stormwater management systems for quality control. So in general, the, the drainage system does not meet general city standards, general currency standards. Um, on Western Road, the noted deficiencies between Sarnia Road and Philip Aziz inter intersection up to Brescia Lane uh, and Lambton Drive, uh, and these include limited stormwater infrastructure in general. And in particular, there, there is no stormwater catchment on the west side of Western Road. So that's the main feature along uh, that leg of Western Road. Uh, sticking with uh, some further stormwater observations, we have some miscellaneous information provided here, but the main takeaway from this slide are 
that the converging stormwater piping to small downward piping on Philip Aziz Avenue um, is an issue and which eventually flows uh, into the Thames River via an existing outfall. Uh, and that outfall has some performance issues as shown in that photo, uh, issues with, uh, with sizing, but also erosion. So that, that's one of the key features of, of the, the whole stormwater uh, issues here is the uh, convergence of, of smaller uh, to smaller downward piping, as well as the, the performance of that outfall at the Thames River. So with respect to opportunities related to stormwater improvements, uh, firstly, there is a need to improve uh, the overall storm sewer network and drainage. Uh, new storm sewers would be designed to meet current city standards. Uh, quality improvement and treatment of the stormwater runoff would be a large consideration. This can be done through uh, various means, including oil grit separators uh, or other best management practices, such as grass swales, vegetated filter strips, pervious pipe systems, infiltration basin, uh, basins. The objective here would be to remove at least 70% of the total suspended solids that are being collected. And of course, the existing outlet to the Thames River requires replacement. Uh, a new outlet uh, complete with scour protection and energy dissipation would be provided. Other opportunities include the implementation of low impact development measures uh, or LIDs for short, which have the potential to enhance uh, road corridor and, uh, aesthetics uh, and improve uh, stormwater level of service. Of course, implementation of LID stormwater controls may be limited in areas where there are existing utilities and native soil conditions or, and where native soil conditions are not favorable. So there are some limitations to their implementation, but that would certainly be, we would certainly be looking for opportunities for the implement, implementation of these LIDs. From a natural environment perspective, we have completed our initial screening and investigations within the study area and provide a, a summary of the species that may occur in this area. The majority of these would be located uh, within the Thames River corridor. Without naming names, we have the potential for nine uh, breeding bird species, 14 reptiles, and nine bat species. Also, we have the potential for 10 fish and 10 mushroom species that may exist within the project limits. From a woodland, uh, for the woodland located southeast of the western uh, Sarnia Philippines intersection, we have a number of trees. Uh, including the Manitoba maple, black walnut, um, wild mustard, and, ha and hackberry. Uh, the, Bullard the Boulevard Tree uh, Inventory and Assessment identified 130 trees along the corridor, and most trees were found to be in good condition. Uh, the Stage 1 um, archaeological assessment was completed. The assessment indicated a high level uh, or high potential for the recovery of both Indigenous and, and Euro-Canadian archaeological resources within the parts of the study area. Um, but due to the excessive development of properties, uh, uh, including Western universities and associated parking lots, it is likely that the majority of, the, uh, of these areas have been extensively disturbed. However, there are a number of small sections of lawns and fields within the study area limits where archaeological integrity could remain intact and the potential for the recovery of those resources uh, is high. Uh, as such, stage two studies would be required in these high potential areas uh, in areas proposed um, uh, for work. So where there's potential for disturbance, um, you know, due to recommendations that are put forward, uh, those would be the subject of our, our stage two studies. The, the area also contains a number of cultural and built heritage resources. There's one designated heritage property, which is referred to as the Philip Aziz property located at 150 uh, Philip Aziz uh, Avenue, which is aptly named, of course. Um, and then we have uh, three other uh, listed heritage properties as noted uh, on the slide as well to be considered. Okay, I'll take over from here. Uh, these, this, the next part of the presentation, uh, uh, looks at the, the phase one and two activities we've completed, uh, as I described earlier. Uh, so the first part was coming up with the problem and opportunity statement. And uh, basically, like I said, it, it's the, the principal starting point of the, 
the municipal class environmental assessment and it's used to develop the scope of the project and it's the central theme and main integrating element of the project. Uh, so for this project, the, the problem is uh, highlighted here, it's the transportation master plan, the 2030 TMP. I identified it, the need to upgrade this intersection within the next five years. Uh, as we've discussed previously, this intersection accommodates uh, vast amounts of pedestrians, vehicles, cyclists. It has multiple uh, transit routes and uh, with thousands of passengers. The intersection currently is experiencing traffic congestion. There's with that congestion comes safety concerns. Uh, there's increased delays, and, uh, and that's for not just uh, vehicles, but for all users. And if anything, anything isn't, if it's just left as it is, it's just going to get worse. And uh, also, as mentioned previously, the, the storm drainage in the area it, it does not meet the current design standards and requires some upgrades. So that's the, the highlight of the problem for the for the problem and opportunity statement. Uh, the opportunities we have now are doing this process, we can develop a range of planning and uh, design concept alternatives that can improve all of these pedestrian, cyclist, vehicular and in intersection uh, constraints. Uh, we can improve continuity with work that's already been completed to the north side of Western Road, as well as the south side of Western Road and kind of create a cohesive uh, streetscape throughout the, this area now. Uh, it gives us an opportunity to consult with the public, such as we're doing right now, gather feedback, and all that feedback is then used to help select the best plan for the future going forward. Uh, the, this process also allows a, the, the section of the road to follow London's complete street guidelines, uh, the urban design guidelines, as well as looking at and taking con into consideration the University of Western's uh, master plan vision, uh, which can potentially create a gateway to the campus in this area. And lastly, it's, we're going to create an intersection that is functional for all users, and that's students, children, cyclists, seniors, motorists, uh, everybody. So phase two, we've come up with uh, planning alternatives to help uh, to, to help fix this problem. Uh, the first alternative that we come up with is the, the do nothing alternative. Uh, it's really just there to provide a basis on which we can compare all the other alternatives. It won't address any of the problems. It's just a, a baseline comparison. Uh, our second alternative is to expand uh, pedestrian, bicycle, and transit use in the area. So looking at ways to divide, divert traffic into to, to use transit or use other modes of transportation, such as uh, cycling, walking. The, uh, the third would be operational improvements. Operational improvements look at uh, in improving turning lanes or adding turning lanes, changing signal timing, and overall optimizing how the, the intersection currently works. Uh, fourth would be improvement to parallel roads. That's going to look at uh, adjacent north-south corridor roads, seeing if there's improvements to those roads that can help increase capacity in the area and alleviate some, alleviate some of the pressure from Western Road. Uh, the fifth alternative would be the improvement to local roads, looking at roads within the campus and in the area. Uh, any improvements to these roads that could uh, improve destination access and keep traffic moving better. And the last alternative is looking at improvements along Philip Aziz Avenue, which would include widening it to uh, provide bike lanes, sidewalks, uh, turning lanes and, and increasing the safety of the area as well as providing greater uh, movement for traffic. So to evaluate these, uh, these planning solutions as well as the future design concepts, the, we have uh, socioeconomic factors that look at property impacts, potential impacts of businesses, uh, the cultural environment, which is archaeological resources, cultural heritage, and built landscapes. So how, how would these alternatives affect, uh, say, the Philip Aziz property or any other archaeological resources in the area? Uh, 
next would be how does these affect or impact or enhance the natural environment, aquatic environment, terrestrial environment, as well as uh, species at risk. And included in that is also uh, how do these alternatives affect uh, source water protection. Uh, then we get into the design criteria or the, the technical criteria, sorry, which looks at uh, how easy or how complex would the design of these alternatives be, uh, the ease of construction for these, does it increase safety? Will it change or improve the level of service for the intersection and the road? And, and, and does it comply with the, the, the 2030 Transportation Master Plan or the urban, urban Design Guidelines or the Complete Street Design Guidelines? And the last uh, criteria would be the economic and financial criteria. How much would it cost to build, design, and would there be any ongoing maintenance costs or operating costs for the each uh, each solution and what any potential land acquisition costs that may be required for the the uh, recommended solution so we, we screened all the alternatives that we've looked at so far in the planning the planning alternatives uh, against these criteria uh, and as we said, do nothing does not address the problem opportunity statement it doesn't comply with the 2030 master plan so it doesn't get carried forward for for additional study uh we look we put the expand alternative to expand pedestrian bicycle and transit use and while that can help relieve some of the pressure in this intersection it, it, it can't be the sole uh the, the sole uh solution to the problem uh, same with operational improvements. It, it can relieve some of the pressure, but on its own, it does not provide uh, a full solution. Improvements to parallel roads, uh, it doesn't provide the necessary uh, capacity relief in the north-south corridor. Uh, Wonderland Road and Richmond Street, which would be the, the closest parallel roads, are, are are outside of an acceptable proximity to, to relieve these, this pressure. And, and Platts Lane would require widening of the CP Railway Bridge, which is a huge undertaking. And, and it, it doesn't really solve any of the local turning movement issues. Uh, improving the local roads, it, it does, uh, it can, can uh, relieve some of the traffic pressures. It, it is supported by the Western uh, Master Plan. And finally, the sixth planning alternative is the improvements along Philip Aziz Avenue. And this does address the problem opportunities statement and complies with the 2030 master, transportation master plan. Uh, it will prevent continued service degradation, uh, but again, on its own, it's not the only, it, it, it's not the sole solution. So what we've recommended after screening all these alternatives against the criteria is that we need to combine the alternatives and alternative two, three, five, and six uh, will be the recommended solutions to move forward to look in, into phase three, which is the design concepts. So all the design concepts will, will have these planning solutions in mind when we move forward with, uh, with, with those concepts. And so what's next now is we're going, these are the next steps of the, the, the planning process. Uh, for the rest of the fall of this year, we're going to collect input that is received from the public agencies, uh, stakeholders, and we're going to use that and consider that input for these planning alternatives. Uh, and it'll be documented for the future environmental screening report. Uh, we'll then move into phase three of the EA process. Uh, and so through winter and spring, we're going to develop alternative design concepts, which will be, this is be the more high level, uh, or the, sorry, the more detailed look at how we're gonna solve some of these, these intersection issues. There'll be uh, uh, looking at turning lanes and all, all the different planning alternatives that we've come up with and how we can incorporate them into a good design. We'll hold, PIC number two in April of 2022. And in that, that uh, PIC, we will then present to you all the alternatives that we've come up with for design. We'll show the evaluation of those design con 
concepts and what we're, our preliminary preferred recommended solution for that is. You will then receive comment and consider uh, input from the public agencies and stakeholders again, just like we're doing after this one, to confirm the, the preferred solution. And then we'll move on into phase four of the process, which would be the environmental study report. And we'll pre prepare the report. It will document the entire process and all the alternatives, all the evaluation of the alternatives, all the consultation, and present how we got to the final solution. Uh, from there, we will put the report on public record for 30 days for people to review, comment. It'll be on the, uh, the City of London project webpage for, for this project, and people can download it and read it. And if no issues or concerns are raised within 30 days of this, uh, within this 30 day review period, then the uh, city can move on to detailed design and then tender and construction of the recommended solution. So uh, the, the website to where you can get all this information is the City of London Get Involved uh, Western Sarnia. So it's getinvolved.london.ca backslash Western Sarnia. Uh, on that site, you can leave any questions, comments for the project team. You can view a copy of this presentation. Uh, and you can also get access to uh, send emails to, to, to us to ask any questions. Awesome. Thank you, Paul. Looks like we've had a few additional people join us throughout the course of the webinar. Um, we're going to start the Q&A session momentarily. I want to thank um, also, I didn't have a chance to, to mention this at the beginning, but thank Councillor Hemu for joining us. I see that you're on here as well. Um, we appreciate everyone's time um, because hearing your comments and feedback about this, this is super important. Um, I guess I'll just dive right into some of the questions. Um, we have one here. Is expanding Western Road to six lanes an option under consideration? So remember, who wants to tackle that one? I'll start with it, uh, Carl here. And uh, um, the transportation master plan is looking not to expand it to six lanes, it's looking to uh, improve the capacity through there. And uh, the six lanes isn't an op option that we're really exploring at this time. And the one other thing maybe I'll note, Carl, as well, is uh, that could put, uh, six lanes could put um, the right of way into conflict too with uh, West, West, Western developments as well. Correct. Okay. And while we wait and see if any other questions or comments come through, I'm just going to throw up a quick poll to find out um, who is joining us today. We just want to know a little bit about you and, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and launch this and just take a few seconds to reply if you can. Just helps us get to know who's joining us today. Perfect. Lots of local residents, interested residents. Great. Okay. Perfect. Thanks, everyone. Okay, a couple more questions coming in. Um, okay, did the cumulative traffic numbers take into account that traffic last year during COVID was a fraction of the usual? That's a great question, and and certainly one that required uh, some thinking. So. We the, that traffic uh, obviously was reduced to a, a minimum during that time period. So the data that existed pre-COVID was used uh, with projections uh, forward. So 
the data that was essentially used was intended to be sort of normal, normal in quotations time. It did not include sort of the downturn with, with COVID, but that, that's, a, that's a great question and certainly was worthy of uh, discussion uh, and, uh, and consideration. Thank you. Um, are you planning on having a large tree canopy included in the design? The, the, the question is is uh, as well in advance of, of, of detailed design or, or even uh, more significant planning at this point. Uh, there's always opportunity, like any opportunity for uh, increased uh, tree cover uh, opportunity for plantings is always explored. Uh, for example, we have a landscape architect um, on board with the project who will advise where there are opportunities um, in the event that there are trees, for example, uh, that uh, uh, are impacted. Uh, certainly, they'd be uh, replaced and, and other opportunities reviewed. Uh, as for a, a, a true canopy, um, can't say at this time whether that would be considered. Um, uh, part of it has to be has to consider essentially what that final platform may be and 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 look for opportunities. And to add to John's comment, uh, the last widening that we did north of Huron College, you can see trees that were introduced along there, and we worked with Western and the colleges along the way to introduce trees uh, beyond the sidewalks and onto some of their properties along the way. So. Our goal would be to increase the number of trees from what it is today. Thanks, Carl. Um, okay, another question here. Um, has anyone thought about the Aziz property being designated heritage? That is that is certainly a, a, a very large consideration. Um, I believe in our presentation, we did note that as being um, one of the heritage properties to have regard for. Uh, one of the, the items is, is how to treat uh, that property with respect to anything that gets done along Philip Aziz Avenue. Uh, and certainly we're, we're looking at uh, alternatives and how to treat that, but uh, uh, the property itself, the building itself um, would not be impacted uh, to that degree. Perhaps the entrance may require some modification to suit um, what gets uh, proposed down Philip Aziz Avenue, but uh, rest assured uh, it would receive the highest regard for, for any heritage consideration. And Western, the new owner is aware of that and we'll work along with them to come up with a solution to service the property as well. The driveway is likely to be removed and relocated in another direction. Okay, thank you both. Some more questions rolling in here. Um, okay, questions around budget. What kind of pr uh, project budget are we looking at for something like this? We're early on and, uh, and uh, the alternatives, recommended alternatives haven't been worked out, cost estimating to go along with it hasn't been defined. Um, as much as the project started earlier, there are budgets that are there now. We may have to expand them based on what the final recommendations are, but we have have no final values to know what it may be. Thanks, Carl. Okay, question here around, will planning look at any effects on the Medway environmental study? which is adjacent, adjacent, or sorry, the um, Medway ESA, which is adjacent to the study area. The, uh, in, in particular, the, the area adjacent uh, to the Thames River, um, which will include reconstruction of that outfall, uh, has to receive the highest regard. Uh, and in that, in, and in that regard, we are aware of the adjacent studies um, and uh, in particular, the, the adjacent ESAs uh, moving forward. Um, the environmental team on ACOM side uh, is, is well integrated with the, uh, the city uh, environmental staff and uh, all these will uh, have proper regard for. Okay, a couple more. Um, 
With the heavy amount of pedestrian, cyclists, and automobiles at the intersection, are there alternative designs being considered, which is something different than we see at most other intersections? Anything unique about what we might do there? There cer Certainly, there's a lot of uh, things on the table. Um, there have been many suggestions, even from, from the public to date, uh, something that would be considering uh, would be sort of a scramble type intersection where pedestrians can move in, in, in all directions while traffic's at a standstill uh, and vice versa, the pedestrians uh, stay put while the traffic moves. Uh, as I sort of mentioned earlier, there's, there's a lot of competition for, for movement. Um, so, so anything that would help in that regard uh, is certainly something we would want to consider. But yes, the short answer is yes. We are looking at a, a number of different alternatives that really comes into play uh, moving forward in, in looking at uh, various uh, alternatives now um, uh, for that intersection, but uh, definitely something um, will be looked at and in, in, in different, um, maybe different types of movement at the intersection will be reviewed. Thank you. Yeah, I'm seeing a couple of questions here about um, like the uh, configuration of the intersection or, or different crossing areas for pedestrians. So um, one here, so any consideration of a pedestrian um, overpass or tunnel at the intersection of Sarnia and Western or some kind of pedestrian scramble crossing? Um, they're not sure of the term, but something where pedestrians can cross always at once. Uh, yeah, I, was, I sort of alluded to that just uh, in the previous question. Um, the scramble uh, is, is, is one name for it, um, uh, where the pedestrians would move. Uh, th that is being considered. Uh, the possibility of underpasses and overpasses uh, for pedestrians uh, uh, is going to be uh, reviewed. There are certain challenges and difficulty. For example, uh, when you have a tunnel structure, um, you have conflict with uh, infrastructure with buried infrastructures, be it storm sewer, water, or sanitary. Uh, difficult to to sort of put in particular this intersection where you're, you're competing with different services. Um, so so you know when, for example, one one strategy can be to move the um, you know a tunnel further north, uh, which was which was uh, in our thinking uh, the last uh, time around we we started the EA process. The issue with that is, will, will, will the students use that? And, and that certainly is in the university's thinking, uh, in our thinking, the city's thinking. Um, we certainly, you don't want to build something where people don't use. So the further you take it away from the intersection, the less likelihood people will, will, uh, will use it because of, just because of sheer convenience. So the short answer is we are looking at uh, different alternatives. An overpass structure involves a lot of real estate and um, it has to be AODA compliant. Um, unless you put an elevator in it, uh, you put an elevator in it, you, can, you get into some fairly large costs, but it's generally, it just requires a lot of space uh, and you have uh, other safety related issues. Um, so it, it's part of our thinking and it will be considered. Um, there are some challenges with those, with those uh, type of solutions. Okay. Lots of questions coming in. Um, will there be any impact on the UWO pumping station at the base of Philip Aziz? There was a phase two for a run up to Western Road. Uh, yes, there is. Uh, there are some plans of integrating that with the sanitary. Uh, there, there would likely be a connection to the sanitary going up to Western Road. Uh, there is also a connection that leads to the southeast that uh, would be uninterrupted at this point in time, but uh, th that is a consideration that would be brought forward, yes. Some questions here about how we're engaging Western, U Western University in this process. Um, will they be involved um, 
and fully engaged in these consultations? Yes, they will be. They have been consulted up to now, and uh, uh, I, I'm going to call them an active partner because uh, it's their students, their traffic that we're trying to make safer. And uh, there will be some land needs along the way that may be coming from Western, and uh, it's best to work with them along the way and have them understand where those needs are as well. They are an active participant, a willing participant, and uh, I expect that relationship to continue throughout the project. Thanks, Carl. We did just have a follow-up on the budget question, just um, if there, if we can provide any um, comment on the scale of the project, whether we're talking millions, hundreds of millions, or, or what that kind of high, high-level range is. It's millions of dollars, not hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, but I can't say whether it's 5 million or 15 million at this point. Okay, thank you. Okay, some questions again, speaking kind of to the future of the process. Um, comments here uh, to improve corner at, of trot at Platts Lane um, prior to construction regarding cut through traffic will increase during construction. Um, also Combs Ave at Sarnia Road. Traffic cut through is certainly a consideration uh, down the road. Uh, at this, at, a, at an EA stage, uh, we would likely comment that some traffic calming measures would, would need to be integrated in, in all these uh, side streets. Um, ultimately, its implementation would be done during detailed design, but it would be a consideration and it would be something that we would have regard for. Yeah, our, our goal on most projects around the city is to control the traffic that is not cutting through on many local streets. Um, we do have some measures that we can put in place to limit that, but uh, it's, it's not inevitable that uh, it's a solution and there still is some traffic that may find other ways and we'll do what we can to control it. Thank you both. One here, are you planning on making Philip Aziz a, a pedestrian and cycling road only excluding motor vehicles? I guess I would say that uh, we would be considering all forms of, of transportation at this time uh, and, and not exclude uh, any any form of transportation. So uh, I, the answer to that would be we would include everything at this point and, and obviously get uh, buying from Western given its, its location. And Western has a significant parking lot down there that they'll still need access to for uh, more than pedestrians and cyclists. Thanks, guys. Okay, um, Carl, just going back to um, traffic calming measures for neighborhoods, um, can you give some examples of those? We've, uh, uh, there's several areas around the city where we put in some temporary speed cushions. Um, that's something that elevates the, the roadway in a temporary manner. It's a, a rubber speed cushion that uh, traffic has to go over. Um, as they go over, they slow down. There's warning signs on either side and leading up to it. Um, some other things we've done is we put some plastic bollards along the roadway to narrow the lanes uh, at a few spots through a length of roadway. And uh, in doing so, we slow down the traffic in those areas uh, as well. Uh, there are other measures that could come up, but uh, um, it shouldn't be, uh, we'll find something that works. Thanks, Carl. And I guess this is kind of also related. So the timeline references um, June 2022, and they're wondering what the estimated date of construction would be. Um, if this, if the environmental assessment proceeds as, as planned, it would be coming to a close in the fall uh, of 22. From there, we can retain a consultant to carry on with detailed design. There may be utility relocations in 23 
and uh, construction could start in 24. Um, there is coordination and discussions with Western as to how that can work as well. Thanks. Another question here, will Western Road north of the intersection have the center median with planters like it has further north? That, that is one thing that we are considering. Um, there are some challenges with uh, integrating uh, turn lanes into entrances along the university. Certainly, uh, there is opportunity to put that sort of uh, median at some locations uh, with planters. Um, you know, there's some aesthetic, uh, some aesthetic uh, integration there as well. Um, it, it's a consideration. Um, the extent of it is obviously not known at this point, but we would have regard for that. Thank you. Okay, a comment here. Um, uh, it would be cool if there was a raised roundabout for pedestrians and cyclists like in the Netherlands. A roundabout is always something that um, is considered, but uh, it takes up much more land. And it isn't necessarily safer for the pedestrians. There is safety concerns that um, come into play. Uh, but uh, John, you can comment on on whether how far you've gone, if there's anything you've done or in that direction. Uh, not, not yet, Carl. Um, I, I, I believe that uh... I believe that uh, we would consider it, you know, any, any type of um, any type of uh, system in that in that uh, intersection. The the question may have been referred to as a raised roundabout. In other words, uh, a basically a pedestrian function. Um, certainly, um, those sorts of things are, are challenging. Certainly, it would be interesting to consider. Um, ultimately, it's cost uh, and um land requirements property taking may um may have, have a big or be a big consideration and all that but uh again we will be looking at potential overpass underpass type options for pedestrians and uh that that could be one of them and as you said earlier you know, the A would you access usually it's a fairly lengthy ramp to get into something like that yeah yeah so again it's it's for accessibility purposes. Um, uh, it's it's not like you can have a very uh, large grade up to a, a a pedestrian function. You'd have to have a certain clearance to traffic, which is generally at five meters minimum. So you can imagine with a uh, with a a very gradual slope, how much land use would be required on both sides of, of both sides of the street or wherever you have a drop off. Uh, if it's a raised roundabout, you you know you do that in four corners, and you need that sort of land space. So. There's a lot to consider there, and, and certainly, uh, it's it, it's a pretty difficult affair when you get into uh, that sort of uh, structure. I'd say. Okay, um, a question related to cost again: um, Is UWO going to participate in the cost of the project? At this stage, it's pretty early, and where we're at, uh, I mean, I suggest that the last. Widening of the road again here on College Northerly with the medians. We worked along with Western and they did share some of the cost of the project, um, uh, mostly the medians and some of the features within there. So it is a possibility, but we haven't gone anywhere in, in that discussion with Western. The project has, really hasn't taken shape yet. Thanks, Carl. Okay. Please feel free to keep sending questions and comments through. Um, I am going to go ahead and throw up one more poll. Um, this one is to find out how you typically use the area. So again, if you could just take a couple seconds and select your answer, that's great. Okay. A good mix of walking, cycling, and driving. Okay. 
Awesome, some transit users too. Okay, thanks everyone. Okay, question just came in with regards to local streets. Which local streets will we be looking at as part of the study? The, the local streets are, are, are generally uh, within the university area. Um, we would not be looking at putting uh, additional traffic down any of the city streets. Uh, so it, it, from that perspective, it's not, um, it's not, that is not be considered. I mean, the area in general is just not conducive, conducive to adding traffic volume on those city streets. They're, they're not, the residential. It just would not be appropriate to be putting that level of, of, of traffic down there. So uh, so the, the so the residential city streets are not what we're reviewing. Okay, thank you. Hopefully that helped answer the question. Um, again, no no questions in the queue right now, but we're happy to stick around and and please, if you think of anything else, send it on through. I should also mention that while today we're um, we're looking at one study area in the city, um, we will be starting London's Mobility Master Plan. Um, you'll be seeing us out and about in the new year, talking to people across London about what their mobility goals are and some of the, the barriers that you may face when trying to move through London. So stay tuned for more information on that. Um, that's really an opportunity to comment on a citywide plan uh, for transportation and mobility moving forward. Um, just looking at the Q&A um, box, um, would Brescia Lane be one of the streets under review? Uh, yes, potentially. Thanks for confirming, John. Um, just for some clarification there, um, how would, with reference to Brescia Lane, how would cars get there from Western Road? That that certainly is is a is an issue that's down the road in terms of um, in terms of how that gets integrated. It's something that would require uh, a lot of uh, review, in particular with the uh, with the colleges uh, and universities to see if there's any, are there any options to be explored there. Um, certainly, we don't have that level of of detail to uh, to add to the conversation at this point. So to add to that, what John has said, uh, we are talking to Western, we have talked to Huron College, and we have talked to Brescia as well. So those discussions may lead to some opportunities uh, that we'll explore further. Awesome. Okay, no questions in the, the queue right now, but again, please feel free to send any questions or comments through.
see that we still have lots of you with us. So if there is anything you're curious about, the team is here to answer. Maybe just one point of clarification, if, if uh, we still have a lot of the uh, audience with us. The, the planning alternatives that Paul uh, had discussed or put forth, uh, it's not a one or the other type situation. We would certainly look at um, all of those uh, solutions, how they work with each other, how they can potentially be integrated with each other. So it may be a combination of, of a number of them that gets put, put forth uh, as recommendations. Uh, it certainly is not one or the other. It's certainly not putting all your eggs in one basket. It's uh, it's likely going to be a combination of a number of things that um, may alleviate this piece of the issue or that piece of the issue. It's it's certainly meant to look at all the different issues and how we can best apply a solution to them. It's a good point. Okay, I'm not seeing any more questions that come on through, but maybe we'll give it um, a few more minutes, um, five more minutes maybe. And uh, if anyone does have any final questions or comments, please feel free to enter them in here. Again, this recording, um, this, this webinar is being recorded, so we will make sure this is up on the website as of tomorrow, um, so you can feel free to share it with your networks, your colleagues, um, whoever, because uh, it's always good to get as much input as possible at every stage. And thank you. Thank you to everyone for attending today. We are grateful for your time. See some people starting to log off. And um, as always, if you do have any questions um, that um, pop up after this webinar, feel free to email um, either Carl or John. Um, they'd be happy to answer your questions, um, talk about things in more detail. Um, the project team is always here to, to answer your questions or accept comments. So please feel free to reach out. Um, this webinar will be available online. Um, so again, please share, please reach out to the project team and um, we're, we're happy to keep you posted on all future next steps. So with that, I think I will close out the session. Um, again, thank you for everyone's time and look for this webinar recording uh, tomorrow on the Get Involved website. Thanks, everyone.